In any event, good morning. Uh, bonjour a toutes et à tous. Buenos dias a todas y todos. Uh, un agradecimiento a la OPS por la oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes, a su representante en México, el doctor Cristian Morales, a todos los panelistas que uh, estarán con nosotros en este evento, porque tenemos un elenco estelar hoy. También al público veo que tenemos 270 participantes en este evento y quisiera también agradecer a algunas embajadas amigas aquí uh, en, uh, en uh, Ciudad de México, Japón, España, Reino Unido. Gracias a ustedes por su colaboración. Canada, as a multilateralist uh, country, appreciates PAHO's leadership role uh, in providing the sort of technical cooperation at the country level that is essential, especially in this uh, context. And Canada and Mexico have a long history of collaborating, particularly through the PAHO governing bodies. We share common values and vision regarding transparency, accountability, which we consider critical to ensure that PAHO continues to be a strong and relevant partner in the region. Canada is also participating together with Mexico and other allies in the global efforts to provide safe and effective vaccines for COVID-19. And one example, which I'm sure you've all heard of is the COVAX, COVAX facility, excuse me, uh, and our prime minister announced in September of this year that the Canadian government would provide a contribution of $400 million to this uh, facility. I don't have to tell you that this has been an extraordinary year. Uh, and in an extraordinary year, we've had to take extraordinary measures and we face uh, extraordinary uh, challenges, unique perhaps in uh, our lifetimes. For governments, one of the challenges has been communicating the risks that a pandemic entails to the population. And I have lived this as, uh, as ambassador in a much more modest way as I've guided and led my mission together with an extraordinary uh, team through the past uh, seven or eight months of this uh, pandemic. So I know that the role of effective risk communication cannot be overstated. Communication of information and advice in a public health emergency is a critical element that helps to protect people, save lives, and minimize the so overall social and economic impacts of, uh, of this pandemic. There is no substitute for providing citizens with the information they need, when they need it, and in the right language. Risk communication enables people to make informed decisions to protect themselves and others, and it includes the identification and management of rumors and misinformation. Risk communication also helps reduce the uncertainty and anxiety associated with the pandemic, particularly when it is accurate, empathetic, well-timed, and provided alongside evidence-based containment measures. Later today, my Canadian colleagues will expound on some of the strategies that have been used to communicate with the public and provide information about the pandemic. But let me briefly mention some actions that our government has taken. Since the start of the pandemic, the government of Canada, together with provincial counterparts, because in Canada, like in Mexico, we are a federation, which means that power is devolved in certain issues to the subnational uh, levels. Um, and other stakeholders has worked to provide Canadians, healthcare workers, and key actors with timely, trusted, accessible, evidence-based information they require to protect themselves, their families, their communication, their communities, and their businesses. The current focus is on communicating clear, concise, and concrete messages that will cut through the fatigue, through the confusion, while bolstering uh, compliance. This is meant to ensure that the population can protect itself as well as to reduce the impacts of the pandemic on the healthcare system, social life, and the economy. For example, the government is engaged with federal and provincial institutions and indigenous networks to ensure consistency of messaging and share best practices and lessons learned. It has implemented targeted communications on the enhanced measures to constituencies that frequently cross the Canada-United States border. It has used communications levers such as advertising, web, social media, press briefings, national mail outs, partnerships, and community outreach to reach the Canadian public. 
It has been and continues to be especially important to engage community leaders from indigenous communities, racialized communities, communities of color and faith-based organizations to help deliver critical information. Identification and management of rumors and misinformation also remains an important aspect of risk communication moving forward. This information can impede the delivery of accurate pandemic related information, thus hindering efforts by public health officials to fight the pandemic. Moreover, misinformation can be extremely harmful by exacerbating racism and fear and can result in dangerous behavior. In sum, Canada is very pleased to support this event. We believe that communication is an essential tool to make decisions and protect ourselves and our communities. We hope that this webinar helps illuminate this topic through the participation of experts that have gathered here today to share their knowledge and their experience with us. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much and good morning to everybody. I know my colleague Christian Morales uh, is, is uh, trying to fix a problem of connectivity, so he will be with us very shortly. Uh, I'm here in my capacity as resident coordinator at interim of the United Nations system in Mexico. So it's a real pleasure on behalf of the UN system, the UN country team here to say hello this morning to you, to welcome you, and also to thank you for gathering together and bringing us together on such an important issue. Eh, voy a hablar en español, dado que estoy en México. Eh, quisiera en primer lugar saludar al embajador eh, Graham Clark, el embajador de Canadá en México, a todo el equipo de la Embajada de Canadá por su liderazgo y colaboración en un tema tan importante como el que hoy nos convoca. Por supuesto a mi colega Cristian Morales, que estará muy pronto sumado a esta conversación, y a las embajadas de Japón, de España y de Reino Unido por toda su colaboración así como a todas las personas que hoy nos acompañan en, esta, en este encuentro global, a Sarah McKenzie, a Shauna Hemingway, a Sheito Tomoya, a Melinda Frost y a todas las personas que están aquí. Es un gusto saludarlos esta mañana. Quisiera en primer lugar eh, señalar, como ha dicho el secretario general de Naciones Unidas y las propias autoridades mexicanas en cabeza de su canciller han reiterado, la gran importancia que estamos viendo el día de hoy a la colaboración multilateral para dar respuesta a la gran crisis que enfrentamos como humanidad y la relevancia de la colaboración y la solidaridad internacional en un momento como este. En este sentido, sabemos que esta crisis es más que una crisis sanitaria, es una crisis social y económica y que solo vamos a poder salir de ella si trabajamos desde el multilateralismo estratégico, colaborativo y solidario y creo que el encuentro de hoy es una muestra de esa colaboración. También creemos que desde esa perspectiva multilateral, la emergencia de la diplomacia en salud es parte del nuevo escenario global del desarrollo, entre otras cuestiones, en un tema tan central como lograr un acceso equitativo a medicamentos y vacunas, algo en lo que estamos trabajando desde Naciones Unidas con todos los países, pero también la necesidad de reforzar el compromiso de todos los países de la ONU con la Agenda 2030, que ya anunciaba una gran cantidad de desafíos que tenemos como humanidad, que teníamos que atender y que de no atenderlos, crisis como estas nos muestran las desigualdades, la dificultad en el acceso a la protección social y distintos elementos que hoy estamos tratando de atender como, como comunidad internacional. En este sentido, me gustaría, en segundo lugar, señalar la importancia que le damos desde Naciones Unidas en México al diálogo sobre la comunicación de riesgos en torno a la respuesta a COVID. Sabemos que es un desafío que tenemos en todos los países, México no es la excepción, y en tal sentido nos parece muy importante centrar justamente el análisis de las percepciones públicas y la dimensión estratégica de la comunicación de riesgos para que sea un aspecto clave de la cooperación internacional y de la salud pública global. Y allí en la oficina de la OPS OMS en México ha jugado un rol de liderazgo fundamental en analizar periódicamente justamente esa situación y comunicación de riesgo y en orientar al equipo de país en torno a ello. Comentarles que desde Naciones Unidas en México estamos apoyando esta actividad el día de hoy, pero además trabajando, identificando qué estrategias de comunicación podemos elaborar conjuntamente con las autoridades 
de México para poder atender los desafíos que presenta la situación de COVID. Y finalmente señalar que nos parece de la máxima relevancia justamente aprovechar este momento para reforzar los lazos de solidaridad entre todas las naciones, entre todas las comunidades que estamos enfrentando esta pandemia. Y permítanme, pues en nombre del Sistema de Naciones Unidas, enviar un mensaje de solidaridad a todas las personas que hayan, se hayan visto afectadas por esta enfermedad, a las personas que han perdido familiares o personas cercanas, y desde luego a todo el personal de salud de todo el mundo, a todos mis colegas de la OPS, de la OMS, y a todos los representantes que están aquí. Esperamos que el encuentro de hoy permita, con los expertos, expertas que hoy tenemos, de gran renombre y experiencia, nos permitan identificar aquellas cuestiones que podamos integrar en cada uno de nuestros países para atender esta pandemia. Así que deseo muchos éxitos en este intercambio, y lo que de aquí salga, sin duda, será una guía para lo que seguiremos haciendo desde Naciones Unidas en México. Muchas gracias y muy buenos días. Muchísimas gracias, Belén. Creo que es un buen comienzo para nuestra sesión de hoy. Estamos esperando todavía uh, a nuestros colegas de la OPS para tomar a mano de la, la próxima sesión. Pero mientras agradezco eso, estamos uh, todos enfrentando una crisis sin precedente. Entonces tenemos que unir esfuerzos, compartir mejores prácticas e información. Y ahora le invito a Federico Vázquez de, de tomar la palabra y dirigir la próxima sesión. Gracias, Federico. Si nos escucha el representante, está ya habilitado. Ahora, gracias. Eh, <risa> querido Federico, muchas gracias, colega del equipo técnico, realmente han hecho un trabajo extraordinario. La verdad que sí, trato siempre de ponerme con el público, pero esta vez no fue... Eh, a propósito. Eh, permítanme entonces eh, dirigirle algunas palabras eh, antes que nada a mi querido amigo de Canadá, eh, Belén, la coordinadora residente, eh, también por supuesto eh, Shona, eh, Hemingway y eh, todos los colegas que nos acompañan, incluyendo por supuesto Sebastián Oliel de nuestra sede en Washington. Se, señora Sar Mackenzie, directora general de comunicación estratégica del Centro de Operaciones de Salud, Agencia de Salud Pública de Canadá, y el señor Saito Tomoya, director del Departamento de Crisis en Salud del Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública de Japón, así como a Melinda Frost, oficial técnica de comunicación de riesgo de la OMS. Eh, eh, good morning, everybody, and eh, bonjour a, a tout le monde. A, o colegas de Canadá. Eh, dos menciones relevantes que son importantes en este momento. Creo que eh, estamos viviendo, como se acaba de decir, eh, la crisis de, de salud pública más importante de la historia, eh, de la historia reciente, sin lugar a dudas, y eh, estamos terminando este año 2020 con muchísimo, eh, muchísima esperanza por la, la, la eventual aprobación de algunos de los candidatos vacunales en vacuna. Eh, como ha sucedido esta semana y, y esperamos que se sigan sumando otros. Esa es la esperanza al final del, o la luz al final del túnel, pero evidentemente estamos en un marco también de donde hay que poner los pies en la tierra, donde hay que ser realistas, donde hay que entender que una cosa es que tengamos una vacuna y otra cosa muy distinta es que empecemos la vacunación y otra aún más difícil es lograr esos niveles, esos umbrales de... De, 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 de vacunación que nos permitirán tener una eh, inmunidad de grupo suficiente como para poder ir saliendo de esta crisis. En otras palabras, estamos llegando, eh, vamos a iniciar el 2021 con esperanza, pero en una situación muy similar probablemente a la que hemos estado viviendo en 2020 con esta pandemia que nos deja de golpear y no solo a todos los países, sino que eh, dentro de los países golpeando siempre a las poblaciones que están en situación de mayor vulnerabilidad. Eh, quisiera saludar entonces a todos los participantes, al resto del panel también, por supuesto, y de manera muy especial al señor Michael Wright, eh, que nos acompaña. Eh, esta actividad eh, se inscribe dentro de un esfuerzo que hemos hecho desde OPS, eh, y en particular OPS México, 
en donde hemos reconocido desde el inicio la relevancia que tendría la comunicación de riesgo en la respuesta a la emergencia sanitaria. Se requería un despliegue acelerado para crear un piso básico de capacidades entre diferentes actores y en varios niveles. Leer a la población, entender cómo está recibiendo los mensajes de comunicación de riesgo es clave para poder ir modulando las, eh, el tono y los mensajes que van a permitir una disminución de la dispersión de la epidemia. Por lo que en este marco emprendimos una iniciativa innovadora de análisis político, de percepciones públicas que pudiera guiar el diseño de estas estrategias de comunicación. Quizás hoy día también tenemos que pensar en cómo vamos a movilizar estas competencias, esto, eh, estos conocimientos y, y, esta, eh, y, y, y esta cantidad de gente también que hemos logrado formar eh, en este tiempo y discutir con ellos para eh, tener una campaña de comunicación eh, alrededor de las vacunas que acerquen las expectativas que se ha creado en la población en México y en el mundo con respecto a la realidad a la que me he referido hace unos momentos. En el marco de dicho programa se han re realizado múltiples acciones de diálogo intersectorial, algo que ha sido clave, eh, intercambio con, entre las entidades federativas y las experiencias internacionales y se han capacitado ya cuatro, 400 personas eh, adscritas a las direcciones de promoción de la salud y a las jurisdicciones sanitarias de México. En este contexto y bajo el liderazgo de nuestra oficina de OPS en México, emerge esta idea de impulsar un diálogo internacional para contribuir desde México a fortalecer los eh, lazos de amistad y ampliar las perspectivas de cooperación eh, en una um, intención también de aunar esfuerzos en el marco de lo que nosotros llamamos el despliegue de la diplomacia en salud tan importante, por supuesto, hoy día en el marco de esta pandemia. Entonces, sin más, quisiera agradecerles a todos los que han hecho posible esta reunión, eh, desearnos el mayor de los éxitos, pensemos en que en 2021 vamos a necesitar quizás más aún que en 2020, este tipo de espacios y veámoslos como un primer paso para avanzar en el desarrollo de estas competencias tan importantes de análisis de percepción de riesgo que pueden ayudar a las autoridades sanitarias de nivel federal, de nivel estatal y de nivel local a que los mensajes lleguen donde tienen que llegar, en la forma en que tienen que llegar, y de esa manera las poblaciones puedan asumir eh, sus eh, actitudes, ¿no es cierto?, que las protejan. Una población informada es una población eh, empoderada, y una población empoderada es una población que se va a cuidar, y que nos va a cuidar, y que va a permitir que entre todos podamos salir adelante de este desafío que representa la pandemia de COVID-19. Eso es cuanto. Muchas gracias. Excelente eh, representante de la OPS, Cristian Morales, le agradecemos mucho sus, sus palabras. Eh, con esto es el cierre de la bienvenida otra vez al, embaja, al embajador, a la coordinadora residente, a Belén y al representante de la OPS. Muchas gracias por sus palabras. Adriana. Muchas gracias. Eh, quisiera presentar Ahora a los siguientes eh, panelistas que nos acompañarán esta mañana. Eh, nuestro moderador para este siguiente segmento es, eh, va a ser Federico Vázquez. Y nuestros participantes en este segmento son el doctor Paul Slovich y el doctor Michael Reich. Bienvenidos. Adelante, por favor. Muchísimas gracias, gracias Adriana. Bueno, eh, yo comienzo, en principio va a participar el doctor Slovi, muy brevemente porque su currículum es muy extenso, nos, lleva, nos llevaré un día. Eh, yo le quiero agra agradecer sincer sinceramente porque la, 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 la humildad eh, con la que com comenzamos nuestra conversación a principios de la pandemia, yo desesperado por buscar información sobre percepciones del riesgo y él siempre accedió en los mensajes 
y en parte gracias a, a él y al, y al panelista que sigue, que nos acompañan en esta con, conferencia magistral, es que esta actividad tam, tam, también está inspirada. Este, Paus Lovic, que eh, para quien eh, creo que no, no necesita una pre presentación amplia, es realmente el, fun, el, fun, el fundador y uno de los mayores repre, representantes en el mundo del, del estudio de la percepción del riesgo. Él, es muy, bre, muy, muy brevemente, él, él fundó y es presidente del de Centro de Investigación en Ciencia de la de, 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 de Decisión, eh, es profesor de psicología en la, en la Universidad de, de, de Oregón, eh, ha fundado, ha inspirado estu, estudios por todo el mundo en percepción de riesgo y, como, como les digo, es realmente el representante, la, expre, la expresión internacional eh, más importante en, la, en, en el campo de percepción de riesgo y estudios de la decisión. Él, él también se ha distinguido, le han, le han entregado prem, premios, este, también es parte de la, de la Academia de, Ciencia, de Ciencias, este, también ha, reci, ha recibido doctorados honoris, como en Estocolmo, en la Escuela de Economía, eh, y, tam, y también ha sido es parte de la Academia Americana de Artes y Ciencias. Eh, doctor Slovic, real, realmente es un placer y, una, y un agradecimiento que nos acompañe hoy día. Este, como, como les des, decía, des, decía yo, eh, desde el 76 que se, que se fundó este instituto, o sea que ya hay un tiempo en que esto empe empezó a reflexionarse relacionado, como él dice en sus entrevistas, eh, a juegos, apuestas, ¿no? Como de laboratorio y después se pasó a la reflexión en, en, este, en, en temas de, no, de, 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 de desastres, después el tema nuclear, de la energía, o sea, una larga carrera de reflexión en percepción de riesgos, y bueno, él tiene una serie de reflexiones muy importantes actualmente este, en, la, en, la, en la materia. Entonces, sin, sin mayor preámbulo, le doy la, la palabra al doctor Paul Slovic. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you. Uh, gracias, Federico, and uh, buenos dias, everyone. I thank also the organizers for inviting me to participate in this important uh, webinar today. Uh, I've been fortunate to, been, to have been able to study uh, the uh, risk perception with many fine colleagues over, uh, over a long period of time. And we've learned that the concept of risk uh, is a very uh, complicated uh, mix of factors that, that start with science, but also include uh, psychological, social, and political factors. And uh, that's what makes it uh, very fascinating to study and also very uh, complicated to, to deal with. We've also learned that good risk communication is, a se is essential uh, to uh, managing risk and it's, uh, and it's very closely related to risk perception And that's why I think the, uh, the, uh, the title of this conference, the aim of this conference of blending perception and communication is very appropriate because they are, are, are joined together. Um, and perception, understanding perception is essential to uh, having good risk communication. It's also important that risk communication not just be a one-way uh, uh, enterprise where the experts lecture to the public about what they should do. Uh, what the, the public has important uh, values and concerns that need to be appreciated by the, by the uh, technical, technical community, the medical community. So communication has to be two-way. Uh, we have to listen to the public and understand their values and concerns, uh, as well as trying to inform them. Um, So the, the COVID-19 pandemic poses uh, unique and serious challenges to risk perception and risk communication. Uh, it's an insidious disease that deceives our perceptions and causes people to behave in ways that make the disease difficult to control. Uh, I, I, 
I know where I speak because I come from the United States, which is the world's leader uh, now in the uh, in in the uh, the spread and the devastation of this pandemic. Uh, just this week, you know, nine months, you know, into uh, into this, uh, at least nine months, uh, the U.S. recorded its uh, single worst day, uh, worst worst death toll in one day. Almost 2,800 people died in one day this past week. Um, and there have uh, there are 100,000 people in the hospital right now, and we are getting uh, 200,000 new cases every day. And overall, we've had. Uh, 280,000 deaths, and this is in a you know a a a country where we believe we have uh, good information, uh, good education, good healthcare, and we are uh, we are being devastated by this disease. So let me try to explain a little bit of of uh, what's what's going on uh, in this uh, in the United States, and I think obviously it applies to other countries as well. It's just that. Uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, is uh, number one in this problem, unfortunately. So the main point of my brief remarks uh, is that that uh, stopping the spread of COVID and bringing it under control depends as much on human psychology and human behavior as it does on medicine. By that, I mean that people must listen to the medical and public health experts and follow their guidelines. Um, even when it's unpleasant uh, for us to do that, and we don't see an immediate benefit from following the, the guidelines, we have to, to do that. And then down the road, when, we, when the vaccines are available, uh, people have to be willing to, uh, to take those vaccines, to get vaccinated, or it, they won't have the benefit that they could have. Uh, so here are some of the factors that make it hard to behave in a way that controls the COVID pandemic. First, uh, it, COVID is spread by infected people who very often show no symptoms. So it is spread in an invisible way um, in its early stages. Uh, and it's spread through what we call exponential growth. That is, if each person who's infected infects more than one other person, uh, then it will grow uh, exponentially. Let's suppose that every uh, infected person uh, has contact with and infects two other people. So the disease starts with one, then it goes to two, then it goes to four, then it goes to eight, 16, 32, you know, after six steps of, 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 of uh, Con contagiousness, we've got 30, it goes from one to 32. Well, where will it be, you know, uh, after another five or six steps? Uh, it will be maybe 2,000, you know, and suddenly it's, it's so, so the first thousand uh, people get infected, it takes maybe 11 stages of transition. The next thousand takes one stage. And that is what we call exponential. It's rising very, very steeply. And the, the problem is that uh, the human mind does not easily understand uh, uh, exponential growth. We tend to pr project in a, in a straight line, in a linear way, from very small cases at the beginning. And we think down, down in, the, in the future, it's still going to be small. So we don't have to w worry too much about it right now. And that's the problem. Exponential growth smolders along like a fire that's just smoldering. It seems innocent and then suddenly it erupts into a flame of, of, of infection that overwhelms the system. So we have to recognize that even in places where there are relatively few cases now, as long as there are any cases, it has the potential to erupt exponentially and overwhelm us. And that's what we have seen happening over and over again, not just in the United States, but in countries all over, all over the world. Uh, a second problem that I'm not going to talk about very much is that the diagnostic tests for, for uh, infectiousness with COVID are not 100% accurate. They are good, but they're not uh, perfectly accurate. And that makes it hard to interpret and manage without, an, without experts uh, closely uh, guiding the process and communicating it effectively. 
And by this, I mean that, that, that a test that is said to be 90% accurate, if, if, it, if, it, if you take that test and you are uh, judged to be positive uh, or infected, that doesn't mean that you have a 90% chance of being infected. So uh, uh, it's, it's a complicated uh, communication issue, but I'm not going to deal with that uh, this morning. The, the third uh, factor that, uh, that is uh, important here is what we call psychic numbing. And that is, uh, means that the statistics that we collect and we communicate, um, they're very useful, they're, they're critical to understand the magnitude of the disease, but, but uh, we, don't, we don't react very well to them. That is, we are, we are very sensitive to individuals who are ill, but as the number of individuals increases, we lose that emotional connection to the, to, the, to the individual and they become just numbers which carry no emotion and therefore don't move us. So even though I can talk about hundreds of thousands of cases, uh, those are just numbers. And we, we don't, unless we stop and pause and think carefully and think about the individuals beneath the surface of the numbers, they don't have the meaning to us that they should have. Uh, this is called uh, psychic numbing. Uh, another factor that uh, is very critical is that uh, you know we we are given good information about how to protect ourselves. You know we have to we have to wear masks. We have to socially distance. Uh, we have to keep away from large uh, gatherings of people uh, in in closed spaces like uh, bars and restaurants and gymnasiums and so forth. You know this is what we need to do. And when we first hear this, we're eager to do this. And, we, we, uh, and many people then are very uh, obedient and, and comply with these guidelines, which are essential. Uh, but over time, uh, we start to relax. Um, we, it's very difficult to maintain this level of, of distancing uh, and, and, and caution over time. And this is because what psychologists calls the, the reward and punishment uh, schedules are backwards from what is needed to keep, to maintain the behavior. And by that, I mean that we don't see an immediate reward from doing the right thing. That is, you can, you can stay in your home, you can wear a mask. You don't directly see that you've just protected someone. You know, the, 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 the benefits of what you're doing are invisible but you immediately feel the costs. You know, that, you know, it's a bit inconvenient to wear the mask slightly, but it's even more convenient to be uh, socially distant from your family, from your friends, from, from the workplace. So, so those costs are immediate. The benefits are uh, invisible. Uh, the same, so the same thing happens if we disobey the guidelines. Uh, we don't see an immediate cost. I mean, you go out and you party with your friends. You don't see the, uh, you know, the risk that's that's being perpetrated there. All you, but you see the benefits very clearly. You've had a good time with your friends. So what psychologists call the, you know, the rewards and 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 costs are backwards from what is needed to maintain the behavior. And therefore, over time, uh, people uh, inevitably start to relax uh, and. And this has very uh, important uh, uh, implications for, uh, for, for the managing of this. This means that, that, um, that regulations have to be enforced. We, we can't assume that out of people's goodwill, they, will, they will, do the, will do the right thing for a long time. It will inevitably, they start to relax. And so um, as long as the disease is there and spreading exponentially, you have to you have to maintain these protective behaviors. So there has to be, there has to be uh, uh, enforcement, uh, maybe strict uh, to, to, uh, to punish people who violate the guidelines, but there also has to be a recognition, recognition that the economic costs are great and that, that people uh, need to work. They need to, to, to provide for their families and therefore, to the extent possible, governments must step in and provide uh, economic uh, aid 
uh, to people who are not able to work uh, and who are following the guidelines uh, as long as the disease is still uh, at, a, at a high and difficult uh, level. So I think this is the basic uh, uh, quick uh, story here of, from the psychological and perception uh, perspective of what we need, what we, what the challenges that we are, we are facing uh, from this uh, very uh, uh, insidious and deceptive uh, disease. And uh, so um, uh, I uh, clearly uh, risk perception and risk communication are the right topic uh, to study today. And I wish uh, the, the, uh, the, the I wish for the success of the meeting today. And thank you again for allowing me to uh, to uh, participate in it. Muchísimas gracias, Dr. Slovik, por sus reflexiones en, esta, en estas palabras inaugurales. Este, apro, a, a, aprovecho antes de pasar al, a, a Michael Rake este, a presentarlo, pero antes nada más agradecer otra vez. Nos acompañan hoy de gente veo de Paraguay, de Chile, de todos los, los estados de México. Hay, hay, hay gente de Europa, de Canadá. Entonces, bueno, tenemos un público me, 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 mexicano, pero también regional e internacional. Entonces, otra, otra vez un saludo y un, un agradecimiento por su participación en todo el mundo, ¿no? Hasta Paraguay nos escribe, Bra, Brasil, en fin, ¿no? Eh, voy a, pre, a presentar muy, bre, muy, muy brevemente al doctor Michael Rake. Él también es ampliamente conocido, pero me, pero me gustaría destacar tres aspectos. Bueno, él es politólogo por la, por la Universidad de Yale. Eh, antes tiene un background igualmente en la Universidad de Yale, en aspectos este, más bioquímicos, ¿no? Él, él nos podrá decir, pero su doctorado lo realizó en ciencia política y desde el 83 es parte de la Academia de Harvard y de la Escuela de Salud Pública en, en, partic, en, partic, en particular. Ha, ha recibido dis, distinciones, por ejemplo, en, en Japón, este, ha, disting, ha, ha recibido otras, otro tipo de premios y de, y de distinciones. Es un experto también en el sistema de salud en, en Japón y en la salud global y los, en los sistemas de salud internacionales. Eh, yo destaco, eso es un primer aspecto. Dos, eh, gra gracias quizás a Mike, Michael Ray, que yo hablo siempre de la escuela de, de, de Yale desde el 66 hasta él. Este, todos los que nos interesamos por la salud pública desde un, desde un punto de vista más politológico más po o más político, creo que le debemos a él esta posibilidad de pensar políticamente y de comprender pol políticamente la salud pública. Eh, creo que es uno de los grandes ap aportes del de doctor Rage en el, en el mundo, este pensar pol 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 políticamente la salud, y creo que en la Universidad de Harvard, pero no solo ahí, este, ha dejado como un, le un, un legado ya importante. Y el tercer aspecto, este... A, a partir de eso, él, él es un creador, junto con su col, colega David Cooper, de un instrumento que se llama Pol, 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 Policy Maker, que es una herramienta de anal, análisis pol, político aplicado y de diseño de estrategias. Eh, yo quiero decir que además de ser una herramienta muy interesante, muy aplicable y muy importante, no solo para la sal, salud, ha, ha, ha sido una fuente de inspiración para toda la iniciativa que hemos impulsado en la OPS en México y en, mate, en materia de percepciones en, en particular. Y cuarto punto, y con, con esto le doy la, la palabra, es un gran amigo, amigo de México. Él ha sido pro, profesor investi, investigador este, en el Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública y yo lo considero casi un me me mexicano. Así que con, que con esto este, le, le doy la, la palabra al, prof, al profesor Michael Rake. Muchísimas gracias, doctor. 
Muchísimas gracias, Federico. Eh, buenos días a todos y a todas. Eh, agradezco mucho la posibilidad de hablar y participar en este seminario importantísimo en este periodo difícil en todo el mundo. Eh, Soste cantan ni eh, México no eh, Nihon Taishkan no Minasan ni mo Yoroshiku o Nagai Taishimasu. Harvard Daiyaku no Raishiku de gozaimasu. Um, voy a hablar hoy solamente en inglés, eh, siguiendo al profesor Slovich. Um, as Federico mentioned, I've spent the last 40 years in a school of public health as a political scientist. Uh, this is a rather unusual position, uh, both for political science and for public health. Uh, but basically, as Federico said, I've spent my career trying to get people in public health to think politically. The pandemic has just made this point extremely clear to everyone all around the world. A core part of what I've tried to do is to get people to understand from a policy and political perspective that they need strategies to manage perceptions. And, and this is where my work complements very nicely the work of Paul Slovich. Perceptions of problems, perceptions of policies, and perceptions of solutions. So that underlines the key point, one of the key points of the pandemic. If you want to do public health, you have to do politics. And if you want to do politics, you should learn how to do applied political analysis. Analysis that you can use practically for managing policies to make them more effective. My main point today is if you want to manage the public risk perception during a pandemic, you need effective strategies for policy communication, policy communication as part of your political strategies. It's worth noting that in Spanish, it's the same word for policy and politics. So when people ask me in Spanish what I do, I say I do la política de las políticas but they are somewhat different. Of course, communication is not just important for COVID-19, but for many public health problems. Earlier this week, I spoke with the director of the malaria control program in Uganda about communication strategies for malaria. And he said, policy action starts with communication. And he continued and said, it is important to change the mindset and the language and the images around malaria if you want to make progress. These messages hold also for COVID-19. In my comments today, which will be without PowerPoint in about 10 minutes, I'd like to focus on how these connections between perceptions, communication, and policy slash politics affect trust during a pandemic. Trust, la confianza, is one of the most important and underappreciated concepts in public health. In practice, trust is easy to destroy, but difficult to reconstruct. It plays, trust plays key roles in the processes of control for a pandemic, as we have seen in this complex and uncertain year of 2020. As I remind us that this is the year 2020, isn't it odd? A phrase that is associated with clear vision, 2020, is also the year that has been so filled with visions that are obscure and twisted. And I say this with just one slide, which is my background. And as Professor Slovich mentioned, this is the background of the United States. This is from today's New York Times. We have hit a new huge surge. The country is experiencing one of the worst epidemics in the world. And I think a lot of it has to do with questions related to trust. 
So I'm going to give you several examples. The first is trust in masks. One of the examples of loss of trust in the United States has been the debate over masks. The debate has been emotional, polemical, political, and sometimes even violent. It's been a debate between those who say masks are necessary to protect oneself and to protect others, and those who say the mask decision should be an individual choice, an exercise of individual liberty, not imposed by any external agency. For someone who works in public health, this thinking is like the idea that stopping your car at a red light is a personal decision, as if a red light is only a suggestion that person that and that personal liberty as a principle is more important than social rules for protection. This is a clear area for communication strategies to shape public perceptions of masks, as has previously happened with other technologies to advance public health, such as seat belts, bicycle helmets, even soap. Just as an example, look at what Joe Biden has just announced, a national request to wear masks for 100 days when his administration starts. It is a stark contrast with the attitude, words, and actions of the current administration. Next, let's look at vaccines. The problem of vaccine hesitancy is a global phenomenon found in countries around the world recently written about in an article in The Lancet. But there's an odd conflict in social expectations here. On the one hand, people feel that the arrival of a vaccine will bring the pandemic to an end, almost as a kind of magical solution. On the other hand, people feel a resistance to agreeing to take a new vaccine. The existence of a vaccine alone will not be sufficient to end the pandemic. There's a need for social acceptance of the vaccine and a need to continue many of the current policies to contain transmission. My Harvard colleague, Dr. Howard Koh, wrote in October that nearly 80% of the US population believe that politics, not science, is driving vaccine development. According to polls, he wrote, six in 10 Americans surveyed say they will not take a vaccine as soon as it becomes available. We will see what happens in the next few months. The lack of trust could lead to the failure of a vaccine campaign. This area ought to be pursued through communication strategies to shape public perceptions around trust in vaccine in the United States and other countries. What does PAHO, OPS, and OMS, the World Health Organization, tell us about strategies to improve public trust around vaccines. Third, let's look at trust in contact tracing. This is one of the most important tools in pandemic control. Contact tracing helps slow down transmission of the virus from person to person. But this intervention requires that people who are exposed or potentially exposed agree to provide the names of other people agree to self-isolation as a precautionary response and also agree to be tested. But in many Western countries, including the United States, people with a positive test for the virus have resisted providing names of contacts, in part due to a lack of trust in government representatives and part due to a lack of trust in how information provided will be used. Contact tracing has shown to be significantly more successful in Taiwan and Korea, for example, than in the United States or Europe. In Taiwan, an infected person names 15 quince contacts on average. While in Spain, it's three persons, one, two, there we go, three. In France, less than three persons. And New York City, it is 1.1 persons. The lack of trust in the government may be a fundamental reason for the failure of contact tracing in the United States. In short, the rollout of contact tracing requires alongside it 
the rollout of communication strategies to create public support. Finally, and this is my last point, these problems, underneath these problems of trust is a broader lack of social trust in science. Remarkably, in the United States, many people still do not believe that the virus exists or that it causes problems that are critical to health. There are stories of people in the United States who are literally in the intensive care unit dying from COVID infection, who continue to think that the pandemic is not real, that it is a political conspiracy, that it is no worse than the flu. Without trust in science, without trust in scientific experts, reliable scientific experts, it is hard to change people's mindsets and behavior. This is perhaps the fundamental challenge raised by the pandemic we are now suffering through. How to address the loss of trust in science and scientific thinking in our societies, regardless of income level of the country. Finding effective communication strategies to shape public perceptions about trust in science is a basic requirement for each society confronting the pandemic today. Muchísimas gracias por la oportunidad de participar en este seminario. Y esto es lo que yo tengo a decir. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Dr. Rage. Eh, qué interesante. Bueno, este panel se concluye, pero sin antes este, voy a volverles a dar la, la palabra a ustedes. Un momento más para conclusión o un cierre. Eh, sin, simplemente hacer una reflexión. Eh, sin, sin ninguna duda, creo que por un lado, doctor Slovic nos ha mencionado algunos aspectos de la psicología, de la percepción del riesgo. Michael Rage nos ha hecho énfasis en la importancia de la confianza como variable más política. Más, más nos invita una vez más este, a pensar pol políticamente en la salud pública. Eh, doctor Slovic tam también fue uno de los pioneros en, en, en traer, en integrar la, re, la, la reflexión de la política en la percepción del riesgo. Este, y hoy ustedes han, 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 han hablado de esto. Hay, hay una, una, una serie de pre, preguntas en el chat. Yo no, no, no ambiciono a recogerlas porque son muy extensas, pero hay una que quizás eh, hace un vínculo entre su reflexión. Eh, por ejemplo, y se trata de, de decir, bueno, eh, este, la capacidad de, persua de persuadir, de influir en los comportamientos de la sociedad, como ejemplo en esta pandemia, que tiene que ver mucho con el poder suave, ¿no? La, la, la capacidad de, de, de influir en comportamiento este, para obtener un res res resultado. Luego, eh, hay quien dice, y esto lo, esto lo recojo de la reflexión del chat, hay, hay quien dice, esto se puede hacer vía instrumentos del poder suave, la persuasión, la atracción, la influencia en percepciones, y hay quien dice en el chat, no, esto requiere de poder duro, re, re, requiere de castigo, requiere de multas, re, requiere de enforcement, ¿no? O sea, re, re, requiere eso. ¿Qué piensan ustedes? Este, ¿Qué lección podemos aprender? Porque es muy, es muy interesante cuando uno piensa, ya, ya sea en la, clave, en, en, en la clave de Dr. Slovic, percepción de riesgo en, tem, en temas en, en el tiempo más acotados, ¿no? O en el Dr. Rage, en donde dice el ciclo de una política pública o la influencia en una reforma en salud, pero en una pandemia que va un año prácticamente y que va para el que sigue, eh, es un des desafío mayúsculo, ¿no? El cómo gestionamos, el cómo entendemos las percepciones que son muy cambiantes. Este, entonces, eh, imaginemos el escenario de, las, de, las, de, la, de la vacunación, ¿no? El pro que ya está en el discurso y que el pro próximo año... ¿Cómo hacer a lo mejor para reconstruir esa, esa confianza 
que Mike, Michael Ray nos, nos recordaba y los aspectos que Dr. Slovic nos ponía en el, el análisis de su reflexión. Yo, yo solamente les, les comparto estas ideas para que ustedes puedan hacer un comentario cada uno, Dr. Slovic y Michael Ray, de cierre de su, inter, de su intervención. Eh, Dr. Slovic. Uh, thank you. Uh, that is a very uh, important uh, question that was was raised. Uh, there's no simple uh, answer. Uh, clearly, uh, there has to be some uh, enforcement, as uh, as uh, Michael Reich uh, pointed out. Uh, we enforce uh, stopping at a red light. We don't leave it to to individuals. There, uh, we we re require that. Uh, on the other hand. Um, we have to, we have to, I think, uh, use a sense uh, of soft power that I think what is important is that, that uh, people understand the, how this disease is impacting uh, individuals, you know, to move, we have to move away from the statistics. Uh, I think there has to be um, more consciousness, more communication about, about uh, the individuals who are being affected by this uh, uh, devastating disease, and also about the, uh, the, the health community, the, the, the courageous uh, workers in the hospitals uh, who are uh, being exposed daily to this disease and doing their, their work. That is, we, we have to kind of see this as a, as a, a, a problem that affects all of us uh, and, and that, uh, we have to, uh, to, to respect each other, but still communicate the reality. The, the, the problem is that, this, that, that if we are fortunate not to experience the disease directly, then we experience it through statistics and statistics will not motivate us. It has to, we have to feel, uh, to appreciate the, the uh, vulnerability, uh, what is, uh, this is doing to individuals and communicate that and, and try to Uh, work in a respectful way with people who, who disagree uh, with us. And then underlying all of this, I think what, uh, what Michael Reich uh, uh, appropriately indicated is kind of the situation in the society as a, as a whole. That is in, a, in certain societies, there, there is sort of an alienation between, between uh, people who belong to different social groups or political parties. Uh, we have to to look at the causes of that and try to, to, uh, to, uh, to fight that divisiveness, the political divisiveness, which uh, is uh, so prevalent in, in uh, many countries today. And that's, of course, a big long-term pro problem. But the immediate problem is to, is to appreciate uh, that this disease affects us all. We're all in it together. And uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's listen to the, the medical community Uh, and not uh, not the politicians. Thank you. Muchas gracias, doctor Lobby, por su reflexión al, al final y una vez más por su participación. Michael, este, la palabra es tuya. Thank you, Federico, and uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I've been a long time admirer of your work, and and I support what you said, everything you said up till the last point, but, but let me come to that. So I think, you know, the question of what's the right balance between soft power and hard power, I think it's a really deep problem. And I think it's something that has to be designed within each society in an appropriate, culturally appropriate, politically, economically appropriate for that particular society. Um, And, and when you think about the use of soft power, we have things like the simplicity of messages, the consistency of messages, the repetition of messages, targeting of messages, validity of messages, and the symbolism of messages. And all of that needs to be taken into account in seeking to change people's mindset and behavior. Let me just note that in thinking about this, again, using my backdrop, the US is a striking example of 
failed pandemic governance. And, and it has been a failure from the top down. Um, and um, I've recently written a short paper that compares pandemic governance in the United States with Japan, where the US is an example of failure and Japan is an example of relative success. And I'll put the link in the chat. Let me, let me conclude with a comment on this question of who is a reliable expert. And, um, and, 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 and let's just say that that should not be something left to personal preferences. And this really has to do with cultivating in society an understanding of scientific thinking, scientific methods, so that individual citizens are able to make their judgments about what constitutes reliable and valid scientific evidence. And I'll finish on my point, my slight point of disagreement with uh, Professor Slovich. Yes, we should listen to the scientists, but we have to be able to use our own judgment about what scientists are saying and whether it coincides with reliable scientific studies and thinking. And we also will listen to the politicians. We need politicians who have critical scientific thinking and reliable scientific experts. And I think we're witnessing that transition in the United States now from the current administration to the new administration. And, and I think we will see changes in the tone, changes in the communications, changes in policies, and hopefully changes in control of the pandemic in the United States. Thank you.